How should you test for SIBO? Well, today we are going to break down a research study that explains the best methods for testing SIBO. Hi, I'm Dr. Ariane Missimer. I'm a functional medicine practitioner, a doctor of physical therapy, and registered dietitian. And today we are going to take a look at the performance and interpretation of the hydrogen and methane testing of the North American Consensus Guidelines so it can help guide your clinical reasoning for testing and, of course, treatment. So whether you are a patient suffering from symptoms of SIBO or you are a clinician trying to differential diagnose a functional bowel disorder, you can appreciate that SIBO testing has been quite controversial and complicated in that there's poor sensitivity and specificity as it relates to SIBO testing. Currently, the gold standard of testing for SIBO is actually a microbial culture where they do an enteroscopy and it is very invasive, it's very expensive, and there are a tremendous amount of false positives. So in 2017, the North American Consensus Guidelines took approximately 26 different papers that were evidence as well as expert opinion to come up with specific guidelines for testing for SIBO. So the aim of this study was to objectively assess the performance of these particular tests and the participants' symptoms before, during, and after the investigation. So 725 participants were included in the study. They were all referred to a functional GI clinic, and they had had a previous SIBO test that was positive between 2014 and 2017. They had to follow the standard protocol. So for 24 hours prior, they had to follow a low fermentable diet, 12 hours fasting prior to the test. They had to also stop any type of probiotic at least one week prior. They were able to stay on a proton pump inhibitor during the testing process, and they should not have been on any antibiotics for at least one week prior. There were three primary groups that the participants were divided into. Number one is lactulose. Number two is glucose. And number three was the carbohydrate metabolism group, which was also further divided into fructose and lactose. After ingesting the substrate, the participants were monitored over a period of time. So whether that be 120 minutes or 180 minutes, they were also provided different amounts of substrate. So for example, in the lactulose group, they were looking at 10 grams versus 16 grams of lactulose. Or the glucose group, it was 50 grams versus 75 grams. And so not only were we looking at the amount and the duration of time, but we were also monitoring symptoms. So how symptomatic were patients during the test as well as after the test. So this was assessed using the gastrolyzer, which is a breath test. So when we are ingesting a carbohydrate substrate, it has to move into the small intestine. If there is a bacterial overgrowth, then that's going to create fermentation of those carbohydrates, which is going to produce a gas. And so in this case, that's going to be expired through the lungs. So this is essentially what the breath test is measuring is, is there a parts per million that's over 10 within the first 60 minutes? Or is it over 20 within the first 60 minutes? And that is going to indicate if there is a positive test. So what did they find? The previous recommendations through the North American guidelines suggested that 10 grams of lactulose was appropriate for SIBO testing. So in this group, they tested 16 grams. What they found was that significantly more people were testing positive for SIBO compared to the 10 grams of lactulose ingested. However, as you may imagine, this group also had increased symptoms during and after the test. So in the glucose cohort, just like the previous guidelines of 75 grams of glucose, did show in 36% of the participant groups that there was a positive SIBO result. This was consistent with a rise of 10 parts per million within the first 60 minutes of ingesting the glucose. Conversely, only 22% of the participants that ingested the 50 grams of glucose tested positive for SIBO. And this result was significant. And for the lactose group, what they found was that within the 120 minutes, there was 22.5% of the participants that tested positive for SIBO, but when they increased it to 180 minutes, which was the previous guideline, that showed that there was 30% positive cases. And lastly, with the fructose malabsorption, this also showed that extending the time from 120 minutes to 180 minutes increased the percentage of positive cases from 36% to 41%. So what do we do with this information? So some of the take-homes of this study are that it seems as though 10 grams of lactulose versus 16 grams of lactulose for the breath test seems to be more reliable in that there should be less false positives and also less patient symptoms. For the glucose testing, it seems that 75 grams versus the 50 grams seems to provide more reliable SIBO results. And it does not necessarily increase overall patient symptoms with the higher dose. Now, if someone has SIBO 
and they do the 75 grams, they can experience nausea, but overall it was not significant as it relates to an increase in the dosage compared to symptoms. For carbohydrate metabolism, including your fructose as well as lactose, we want to be thinking more towards the 180 minutes of testing versus the 120 minutes of testing. Now, one thing to consider is that if there is a positive SIBO test, then that can affect carbohydrate metabolism. So we do want to recognize that if there is a positive fructose or lactose malabsorption issue, that SIBO could be a factor in this. And lastly, as they looked at the rise in gases over a period of time, it seems that there may be more false positives with looking at a rise in a greater than or equal to 10 parts per million within the first 60 minutes. So that is something to consider as it relates to looking at the duration of the test and the rise in gases. So as I mentioned earlier, this study aims to objectively assess the previous recommendations as the guidelines suggested by the North American consensus. And in fact, it did do a great job of being able to provide more insight as it relates to dosage of substrate, as it relates to what the substrate is, as well as the time of the test and also looking at patient symptoms before, during, and after the test. With that said, of course, there are some limitations. It did not measure hydrogen sulfide as one of the potential gases that can be associated with SIBO. In addition to that, it was not a standardized breath test because the gold standard, as I mentioned, is an aspirate, which is expensive and invasive. So what we can take from this is more insight into how we can clinically diagnose and provide a subsequent treatment plan for our patients. And then also, if you are a patient, being able to understand this in a little bit more depth and recognizing that there's a lot of things that can go into proper testing and with continued research like this, we can continue to find answers and be able to not only diagnose properly, but be able to treat the underlying causes of your condition. If you want more videos like this on root cause medicine, please make sure to subscribe to our channel.